Okay, today we're going to talk about saws. <clears throat> and this is one of those topics. We can talk a long time about saws because there's all kinds of saws. There's chop saws, miter saws, uh, hand saws, band saws, table saws, all kinds of saws. But we're going to talk about three. And because with these three, so get some other stuff in too about the others. Table saw, band saw, hand saw. Now, <clears throat> The queen of the shop is the table saw. And then I get a lot of people that come in here and ask, well, why? All it does is cut, just straight cuts. Well, yeah, that's exactly what it does. It does it very, very well. With the table saw, do all kinds of cuts from mitered cuts to straight cuts to rip cuts to cross cuts, angled cuts. And it all depends on the saw. The blade that you choose, you can uh, go for different materials. So you as a woodworker need to know what's in your quiver. The first probably saw blade there ever was, was this. This is a rip, and these are very sharp. So when I pass these around, please don't cut yourself. This is what makes a rip a rip. Big gap between the teeth. This is meant to go with the grain, not across the grain. Now this is designed for a through cut. This is not designed for a dado. However, I know a lot of woodworkers that are going to use dados like this blade. It's a good, thick, heavy duty blade. However, with this large tooth set, you don't really get a good cross. Really ragged, torn out. It's the best that you can do, but it does give you a flat bottom. So if you're gonna rip lots of stock, you've got something 14 inches wide that you wanna make three inches wide, this is your blade, okay? <clears throat> Most people don't go with a dedicated blade for a dedicated cut, but this is one. On the converse of that one is this one. In particular, it's dedicated to a cabinet maker's cross cut where it's got to be crisp, clean, sharp edges, not a lot of tear out. To do this, this one has many more teeth, 60 of them, but they're much smaller. Okay. Also, this has got a severe alternate top bevel. This is designed for a through cut. And these are scoring lines. So, what this is going to do is that one high tooth is going to score this side, the other one's going to score this side, and you're going to get crisp edges. Lots of teeth, extremely sharp. This is a full kerf, but it's the alternate high bevel, and you'll see what I mean. If you were to make a dado cut with this, you'd have a pyramid in the center of your cut, just like that. If they're never going to see the cut, who cares? My thoughts is, normally if I put glue in a mortise, glue to go so I don't get hydraulic lock. So actually, I don't mind having that in the bottom of a dado nobody can see because the strength of the dado comes from the side grain, not what's on the bottom. So that gives you a little wiggle room with glue. So if you put too much, you won't get a hydraulic lock. However, if you're going to see the edge, that's unacceptable. It's going to leave those, those pyramids. <laughs> That's a dedicated just to cross cuts. It stinks, it rips. And Americans being frugal people that we are, ask the questions, well, instead of buying two blades for $90, $100 a pop, can we get one blade that does both? And they do, this is called a combination blade. Whereas the rip is something like 24 teeth, and that cross cut is 60 teeth, and I've seen it with 80 teeth, this is a 42. Again, high alternate top bevel. Now, one thing you need to know about teeth and tooth to set this, draw a line straight up to one of these teeth right here. If the face of that tooth was, was even with that line, parallel with that line, called zero hook angle. That means it's not helping you, it's not hurting you, it's just sitting there, okay? If you're get a positive hook angle, the cabinet saw is a 16 degree, which means 
it's leaning forward 16 degrees. So as you put the wood in here, that tip is going to grab it and pull the wood into the cut. This is a 30 degree. So that tooth is really hooked in here. So this is incredibly easy to do. This will do um, an, uh, a very good cross cut. It'll do a very good rip. The rip blade will do a better rip. The dedicated cross cut will do a better cross cut, but this one blade will do them all. Okay. So looking at these blades, not only you're looking at the shape of the tooth, that alternate top bevel or high alternate top bevel this one's got, this false is to tell you the, the sharper, the more uh, pronounced the, the uh, bevel, the cleaner to cut plywood. But this is a good. Now you see all these blades say maximum of 7,000 RPMs. What's the speed of a normal table saw? I've seen them with six, I've seen them with four, but the most po popular one is 5,000. Uh, usually the bigger they get, the slower they get, the smaller they get, the faster they get. So they have about the same speed at the teeth. So if you've got a big 12-inch uh, table saw, if that thing's running at 5,000 RPM, at the, that's really moving and that's a lot of energy and that, that's a... Uh, something that you have to worry about kickback on. If you slow it down, it still does a great job. It just doesn't have that wild, crazy energy. That's why you slow down rider bits when they get bigger. So they're at the tips, they're not going incredibly fast. This one is called a combination blade. And what they did with this one is they wanted to make a dado, a flat bottom dado, but they didn't want to use a dado blade. The only thing here that can make a flat bottom for a dado is that rip. The rip stinks in cross cuts. So what they did here is they gave us a cross cut with these teeth right here. One, two, three, four. These four teeth are alternate top bevel. This big, this tooth here with a big gull in the front of it, that's a rip. Now when you first buy this, this should be set up so that you get a flat bottom. The first time you send this out to be, you're going to get what's called a Batman cut or bat cut. And that means that these two, these little alternate bevels are going to poke up a little bit higher than the flat raker tooth. So when you look at your data, you'll see a little book. You really have to notice because it's going to start off small, but uh, most people will never see that. So this is not only a combination blade, but this will do rips, this will do crosses, and this will leave a flat bottom for dados. So this is kind of a jack-of-all-trade blade. This is a dado set. This is a box cutting set. This is made for all kinds of dados, usually from an eighth of an inch, which is just one dado blade, all the way up normally they go about three quarters of an inch, sometimes a little bit bigger. Depends on the uh, spindle on your table saw. Um, the better ones will come with a four uh, uh, carbide tip breaker instead of a two, but all that does is just plow the stuff in the middle, so that's really, but that's fine. This little jewel is, is something neat. This is designed just for box cuts. This is just designed for joinery. This is just designed for joinery. This is just designed for joinery. The blades we all, I just showed you all, are not designed for joinery. They're designed for cutting, usually cutting through. So this is a whole different type of blade for your type blade. What you're seeing in these is these are both 8 inches in diameter because they don't need to be 10. You're not cutting the wood in half. You're making little uh, grooves in the wood, so this is uh, economical and... Uh, since they're smaller in your table saw, they're actually going faster, I'm sorry, slower at the tip so it's easier to control because it's a wider cut. These blades are quarter inch. The discs aren't, the, blade, the, the tooth is. So it's a quarter inch. So if you put these together a certain way, so one behind each other, you do a quarter inch box joint. If you take the blades and move them to the other side so the longer part is sticking out on both ends, 
Now you're at a three eighths inch box joint. And all you did was just move the position of the, the blades in there. But these are designed for joinery. These are designed for flat bottom and uh, go from there. These are saw blades that you have available to you on a table saw. Do not, do not, please dear Lord in heaven, do not try to use these things on a circular saw. Uh-uh. No, uh -uh. you can find circular saw that will take eight inch blades. Please no, they're just, circular saws are just designed to cut board, woods and hands boards in half. That's it. You can, they can do it very accurately with tracks and everything else, but these specialty blades are designed for table saw. That's the queen of the shop. That's what we use the most often. The next one we use a lot is this by. This is a band saw. And these band saws are kind of neat because whereas a table saw, the blade is coming at us. It's a cut coming at us. So if something happens, that's where the blade is going to throw the wood at us. This, the blade's going straight down. All the chips are going straight down. In the table saw, the chips are coming at us. Straight down. Safest saw in the shop. These are neat because they come in different, we can change the tooth set very easy. When you get a bandsaw blade, they're going to talk to you about Oh goodness, they're going to talk about the number of teeth, they're going to talk about the angle of the teeth, they're going to talk about hook teeth, raker sets, they're going to talk about wavy offsets, they're going to talk about alternate, they're going to talk about skip tooth, they're going to talk all kinds of stuff. All you need to know is this stuff is made with good steel. And this is normal, this is a half inch blade. And when we look at this, we can see this is a timber wolf. We can see that this is a different color. It's a different color in the middle, and it's a different color on the end. Why do you think that is? All bandsaw teeth are hardened. This is silicon steel, really flexible. And this is where it's joined together. And the joint should be that you have to look at it and say, where is the joint? So this was hardened here, and this was hardened in the back. Why would you harden the back? Most of the bandsaw blades we get today and use today, like these sterrets, are only hardened in the teeth. Why would you want to harden the back? The reason you want to harden the back is this blade now becomes double duty. You've made the blade stiffer. If it's stiffer, and you can use this for resawing, it's, it, it'll, stay, it'll stay in the groove much better with the stiffer back. With a flexible back, it, it'll dig the curves much easier. So this is, since most people use band saws to either resaw or to make simple cuts, um, this has been very, very popular. And with the Swedish steel here, it's, it's much more flexible than normal. It takes a lower tension. So if this is a half inch, normally you set your band saw tension to a half inch blade. With this one, this is probably going to come in just a little bit over a quarter inch as far as tension goes, a quarter inch blade. What does that mean? The tires last longer, especially if you, well, they always last longer if you take the pressure off, but it, most people don't. So these blades will let the tires last longer. They won't push down on the tires as much. You know how to sharp, I mean, pull these, right? Teeth away from me, put your foot there, twist three times, twice. Here we go. And then it's it's been stable this way too. You can just put on a hook and she'll last forever. So let's pass this around. Take a look at the teeth. And what I want you to look on the teeth, a typical bandsaw tooth set is if you're looking down the blade, left tooth out, right tooth out, raker tooth. Left, right, raker. What that does is makes the curve that the blade sits in wider than the blade. That way it cuts down heat and friction. Also, it makes it easier for the sawdust that's trapped in the gullets to get out. You don't scorch and burn the wood. That is a typical blade. It's a nice blade. All the blades in my shop are Timberwolves. Of all the bandsaw blades in the world, Sterrett sells more. And if this was the pile of bandsaw blades, this is the woodworking blades they sell. They sell all kinds of stuff. 
If you ever go to a butcher shop, a big, huge meat processing plant, and they got the big bandsaws there to cut up the meat, the dirt blades, because there's no tooth. Those are knife edges. Metal work and metal sterics. I mean, they're they're really uh, big as far as that kind of stuff goes. Um, but standard woodworking, the best thing we have the choice of is the alternate ones like that with the raker. I've seen I've seen the wavy ones where the first one is out a little bit, the next one's out more, the next one's out more, and then it comes back and then it duplicates it on the other side. Uh, what you do with the timber wolf is that you, the first time you put it on, you take all, you, I take the table off. You move everything away so nothing's touching the blade. So the blade is just completely flowing, okay? And then what you do is you turn on the saw. And the blade is going to flutter like this. And then you start adding tension to it. And eventually it's going to start and then it's going to lock in. Once it locks in, you want to do quarter turn more, you're done. Now you bring everything and you put the guides on. That's called a flutter test. The sterets, just put it down to nothing and then crank it up to wherever it says the thickness of the blade is. And you're golden. Off you go. The tooth set that we're going to see mainly with bandsaws in our little world is a regular tooth set and what's called a skip tooth set and a hook tooth set. Those are the three. Regular is what it says. One little blade's right after the other. When you get into tiny little blades like this one, this one's got 14, bla uh, 14 teeth per inch. That one has got, I think, six, and this one, I think, is ten. And you'll see that the gullets get different sizes. The problem with the small tooth set is that it fills sawdust really quick, especially if you've got a big stack of stuff. One of the advantages this has is that if I want to cut something with the table saw, the maximum depth of cut I can usually get on a table saw is under three inches. And that's everything really up. It's going to be two and a half, two and three, and that's it. That's as deep as you're going to go. Uh, with this table saw, with this extension, I can go I can go 12 inches. So I can have a whole bunch of black wood. I can tape them all together, have them this tall, and whatever cut I do, if I'm rounding a quarter, I'm, I'm doing, I'm cutting dovetails. If I got these all lined up, all stuck together, taped up good, I can do them all at once. You can do that with a band saw. You can't do that with any other saw. Plus, it gives us flexibility, too. So, um, regular tooth set is what you'll see here. A hook tooth. Uh, could be a skip tooth there. A hook tooth is designed for resaw. And what that is, is if you look at a normal band saw tooth, it looks like this. A hook tooth looks like this. And what that does, just like the hook tooth in the table saw, when the blade is shaped like that, it pulls the wood into it. it makes it much easier to cut. If you're using cutting thick wood, you want a hook tooth. It's going to make you pushing that uh, uh, wood through the blade much, much easier. You also want a, um, uh, a skip tooth. Now, a lot of times you get both in the one. A skip tooth is they take out every other tooth and they make the gullet bigger. Because the gullet's bigger, you can cut a thicker piece of wood without this, uh, the sawdust trying to get out the sides and cause friction and cause and burn and smoke. If you are pushing wood through a bandsaw and you smell smoke and you see smoke coming out of the wood, one means the blade's dull, throw it away, get another one. Two, you're pushing way, way too fast. Or three, get a blade that's got three teeth per inch and not 14, okay? Normally, the thicker the piece of wood, the more, the less teeth you want in. Rule of thumb is no more than six teeth in the wood at one time. So if it's a six, six teeth per inch, it tells you you should be cutting something that's an inch thick. If it's three teeth per inch, it tells you something you can cut eight quarter, two inches thick. We regularly go over that. If you're gonna cut thicker than that, just don't push it as fast. Let the bandsaw clear the sawdust. Another thing that we 
you need to worry about with band saws. This is the throat plate. This is nowhere near a zero clearance sensor. Okay? Which means that it's really easy for little pieces of wood that you cut on a bandsaw to get forced down here between the blade here and the side of this throat. I have broken more bandsaw blades because of that. So I want to show you now how to make one of the best zero clearance inserts you'll ever see for a bandsaw. Okay. Now what we're going to do, make sure this is all plugged in. You want to see it again? That's a zero clearance sensor. I can do all kinds of work now with fine pieces of wood. And actually, I've got better support here now than I did without this here. So this is going to give actually more accurate cuts. And you say, Rick, oh, that's good, but, you know, that thing is going to move around. No, we take our tape. We do this. Make a one, make a two, <laughs> and we let's go like this. Put one over here. One over here. We spare no expense here. Get down. Here we go. Now we're ready to go. And we can do all kinds of stuff with this. If I was so inclined, if we had a piece that came out to here, we can actually, we make a line right in front of that tooth, drill a little hole, and if we have a piece of wood that's square, we drill a little hole in the center, we can take a little nail, cut off the top, and you can actually set that piece there and spin it, and that bandsaw will cut a beautiful circle. And there's all kinds of stuff we can do with this. Now, again, we're getting down to specialty jigs, but with, with sawing, it, it's kind of neat. So what are other stuff that we can do? Well, one of the things we can do with this is we can cut dovetails. So if we want to cut a nice dovetail, and when I cut stuff on the bandsaw, I like to leave the line. Now, what I would do now is take a chisel and just pair this up, do the final touches. Band saws are kind of clunky for final touches. But you can see how easy was that. And I can do a, a stack of them. So if I'm making a bunch of boxes, I can make uh, two dovetails. It's a piece of cake. Um, the, the, the big slow part comes when we do the uh, pins. Then we're using a regular old handsaw. But it it's a very, very good tool. Most people use it for things that they can get much more use out of. I like to make humidors. And I like, to, when I make humidors, I like to, for them to sit in. Again, this is good because this is one of the things I can stack together and do a whole bunch of these things. Now I'm gonna push this really fast for just a minute. Okay, nice, can do this with a table saw. Just a nice round cut, and this was just freehand. 
I'm going to pass these around. If I'm going to get any tarot, I'm going to get tarot at the bottom. Okay? Here we see the same thing. And that's just the way it's designed, but look through here. The, when I went real fast, it was right through this part right here, and I don't see any burning at all. But pass this around and get an idea. So when you're going to use a bandsaw, know that, yeah, you can get tear out and know where it's going to be. It's going to be always at the bottom. So that means the good side is up. If you need a really crisp edge, the good side is always up on a bandsaw. And again, we can put all kinds of jigs on that. We can use the same jigs on this. We can a table saw. We can have a cross-cut sled. We can have um, uh, a miter sled on this if we wanted to. Uh, this does a very good job. If you put the band saw blade on right so it tracks straight and true, you can cut tops off boxes without taking a lot of wood with it. There's all kinds of stuff we can do. With this one, though, if I cut the tops off boxes, Get yourself a piece of at least half inch MDF, three quarters is better, about this size. Then I take uh, sheets of sandpaper like this. I use a spray adhesive, put them on adhesive, and I put them on the big piece of MDF. And then you take the top where you cut and the bottom where you cut and rub them both together. When you put those together, it'll be you, you lose the line. So if you ever want to do a top of a box, cut the top off of a box. You can use a bandsaw, take a little wood off, and then put it on the, the MDF and the sandpaper, and you're good to go. So, suppose we want to do hand cut stuff, but well, that's fine. That's, we're going to use one of these. <clears throat> these are both saws that you can use for dovetails. This is an American type saw, or it's going to cut on the push stroke. This is a Japanese saw where it's going to cut on the pull stroke. This bigger tooth set is for ripping. The smaller tooth set is for cross cutting. And the other saw that they do, that they make, and I don't recommend for this, but you can use it if you want, is called a razor saw. A razor saw, Japanese razor saw, has no tooth offset. It's got the thinnest kerf of any saw. So if I'm using regular old American wood for this, walnut or maple or... Uh, oak or anything like that. Those are all medium hardwoods. This is fine. If I was using something like uh, lignum vitae, Brazilian cherry, something really hard and dense, then I would most likely um, use that razor saw. Take as little wood off as I can. But how do we use the saws for this? It's always better to start at one corner. Once you get the cut started, go straight down, and then we're going to move it as we go. With all saws, Japanese or American, this is the when it's like this. This is easier cutting. This is harder cutting. Now you see with the American saw. We take a much bigger kerf, so we're taking more wood off. And it still gets caught here. But this is giving us our rigidity for the blade. The blade is, is warping and stuff like that from it. And I'll pass this around and feel how this blade moves. So when we're pushing, we're actually putting this in the blade. This tries to keep it. That's why you can't push too hard. With this type of saw, you just kind of let it go like this. And off you go. So I'll take this around. This is one of my favorites. Again, this is really flexible. Only cuts on the pull stroke. Might have to move the man saw. And what we'll do is we'll go right on this side so you get an idea. Mm 
And then we find our line. And what you normally want to do is start down one side, then bring it down on the other side. So it's looking better and better, isn't it? <laughs> so I'll pass this around. You can see the nice sharp edges of this. Um, you can see that the, the difference in the size and just that little bit of difference right there is the difference between a regular kerf and a thin kerf. And a table saw blade, the table saw blade is one eighth of an inch thick. A thin kerf blade is uh, three thirty seconds of an inch. So it's only one thirty second of an inch thinner than an eighth inch blade. And yet it makes all the difference in the world for an underpowered saw. This will make all the difference in the world for an underpowered arm. So what other things can we use hand saws for? I like hand saws for delicate work. And what I mean by that, I mean final fit and finish. So I'm putting something together. It could be, it could be a, uh, an inlay. I can take a coping saw and I can really work an inlay to make it sure it, it fits into what I've already routed out. Uh, I like um, to use these types of saws for uh, just when something I really want, to, this, I'm going the extra mile to get something that really looks good. There's no gaps in the miters, uh, things like that. What do I mean by that? Well, if I've got a miter, I've noticed that when I put the whole thing together, I'm getting a gap down here in one end, okay? I can take and make a jig for a 90 degrees with this cut out, and I can take the two pieces of wood and put it in a jig and take a saw like this and cut right down that open miter, and when I get finished, it fits together. So you can make jigs. In fact, the, if you look at the old miter jigs, the old time carpenters, there is a space where those two angles came together that you'd clamp your wood into, designed for a, a like. That's a they rough cut it, hanger nade close, and they put the and they did the final fit and finish with that. So this gives you more control. This is not bad. I mean, I can do, when you get good at dovetails, a lot of times you can get dovetails, you can hand cut them faster than you can set up a dovetail jig. However, hand uh, cuts, the shop is quiet, you've got the tunes on, you can smell the wood, you're not seeing huge quantities of dust into the air. Uh, there's a lot to be said for hand cutting. Now, are we going to take an old hand saw and a ripped cut of board? Oh no. Mm. Uh, that's what table saws are made for. If we're going to do a lot of scroll type work, that's what these are made for, circles and things like that. But when we finally put stuff together, like joinery, dovetail joinery, you can do box joints with this stuff. Um, one of the neat things I wanted to show you too, um, when that comes back, a lot of times people ask me, okay, well, how are you going to, especially if you're doing a, a, the pins, the tails of the pins, how do you cut this off? When you get down here and you want to cut this out, how do you cut it out? It's easy. Let me do this real quick.
Did I get myself enough room? I did. This is where I miss a break. And you can just take a chisel and finish up the work. So what you do is you just cut down, just nibble it to get half of it done. Then you can get the blade in or flip it, cut the base, flip it the other way, cut the base, off you go. Again, the nice part about this is it's going to be covered. You can't see it. So you can take a chisel, small chisel in there, flatten everything out. You can sand it, whatever you want to do. It's very versatile. Um, as good as these are, that's, that's, that's nice. That's six teeth. No, this is like 14 teeth. If you want to take a look, come on up here. Um, this one's already gone out, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this one, of course, teeth are hard and back is flexible. And again, this is, I think this is a quarter. A quarter inch is about the smallest you want to go with the bandsaw. You can get smaller blades. You can get down to an eighth. But these normal bearings and thrust bearings don't work that small. I mean, if you need a, the saw blade the least to be long enough so that if you put a bit inside, the back end of the blade is poking out. So you can put a thrust bearing on the back. There are bearing sets that you can use for the really small blades, the 3 16th and 1 8th. Basically, you take all this stuff off, and it's a cup that holds the back of the blade because of the blade so tiny. Um, normally, quarter inch, really for all practical purposes, a quarter inch, three eighths inch, half inch are your go-to blades with this. If you wanna do, set this up for resaw, then five eighths of an inch, half inch to five eighths of an inch are outstanding, about three teeth per inch. When you start getting into the three quarter inch blades, this turn, all these turns here are really, really hard on the blade and they're hard on the tires. The metal doesn't like to bend that much. Now, true, they will go straighter in a uh, thicker wood. It won't follow the grain as much. But if you put the blade on right, a half, a half inch or five eighths of an inch, you can resaw all day long and then I think it will be perfect. Any questions about anything we talked about? Uh, when you mark it. Did you use your dovetail jig to mark those? I use this. This is a 14 degree mm -hmm. saddle. And what this is nice for, if I want to lay this out, okay, oh, okay. this yeah, is straight. Right. Uh -huh. This is the dovetail. Okay. Uh -huh. And why you need both? Because what we want to do, find my pencil. Oh, here we go. Why you doing that? My next question was, did you always that? That piece you took out the width of the, of the blade intentionally, or it just works out that way. Um, so you can turn it. Yeah, yeah. usually, yeah, yeah. you've got to use something like this yeah. for that. You got to have the, right. So if I'm going to cut bands, I mean, have to have that dovetails. Yeah. yeah, I want to yeah. use a, a thin right. blade, and I want to use a, like 14 teeth per inch. Uh -huh. I want to take my time because that yeah. that doesn't give the tear out that you see the yeah. other place. Okay. Sure. But normally, when you want to lay out one of these joints, yeah. you pick where you want your start line. And then, while you're still there, and I moved it. Anyway, while you're still there on the start line, you come right over the saddle like this. And then you come over to this side. And that's what makes it work. Okay. Now it's the same all the way around. I can follow that line right down. And I come over here, 
Now here, normally you'll lay this out for how many dovetails that you want, how they're going to sit. Uh, the nice part about if you do it by hand, if I want a really wide tail, yeah. you can do it any way you want to. But these little saddle things really make it nice. Just remember, you're going to see a long side and a short side. The short side is got bend. The long side is straight. So you can make these straight lines here. And if, I got extra wood up here if anybody wants to try. I have a question. Yeah. If you're going to be doing a lot of uh, plywood panels, cutting plywood panels mm -hmm. on the table saw, that's neither a rip nor a cross. No, that is, think of that as uh, a really tough cross cut. Uh, because not only have you got the panels going every which way with a loose, a, co a cross cut is going to be better, but you've got a lot of. I would. Oh, it's, it's always a cross cut and it's always hard on the blade because of the glue. So you'd want to save like those, uh, Troy blades for your really fine work and maybe get one from Lowe's for cutting plywood. Life's too short to have crappy blades. <laughs> You'll be more happy to spend more money on a really good plywood cutting blade than getting a crappy blade from Lowe's. Okay. It's, life will be so much easier. You won't get the tear out. You'll get, if they tell you this is exactly an eighth of an inch, it's exactly an eighth of an inch curve. So are they labeled as? Yes. Okay. They will say right on them. Um, uh, Floyd is really good about that. If you look at the front of the Floyd package, it will, even the blade itself, a lot of times. Yeah. This tells you what this blade is good at. This is the combination. The combination is a good general purpose blade. None of the cuts are excellent. They're all good, but for most of what we do, that's okay. For that, uh, okay, here's this cabinet makers. You can see in a cross cut and plywood, it's really good. All the other stuff, it's fair. Uh huh. If you contact Freud, okay. or if you get one of these, you'll see in the directions that Freud puts in there a, a place you can call to find out who sharpens these in this area for you. We send ours out to a local fellow who's got a, a grinding setup. I put this one out. This is the rip. Everything is fair except for the rip. Rip is X. That's what excellent looks like all the way across. So blades themselves will tell you what they're really, really good at. Um, the way blades are made now, they're also polishing the sides. They didn't used to do that. They used, used to do the face and the top here because that was just plowing out. They kind of left this alone. They don't do it anymore. They polish these sides now to really... And the, You'll see this carbide drill thick. This will give you a lot of sharpening. They've discovered, I guess we've always known, the smoother the wood, the better the glue joint. So when they make the blades now, they are doing the sides. So when you look at that cut, it looks really, really good. Um, and that's, in fact, when you see a glue line rip, that means the side of that blade is that those facets have been polished to a, just a mirror surface and it's as smooth as a baby's bottom. It's just excellent. So you can put that together and the glue is going to give you a much stronger joint. Remember, the smoother the wood, the better the glue joint. Because this, you've got more glue surface. If you've got nooks and crannies and glues in here, well, this glue's not gap filling, so if the wood's physically not touching, if there's a little gap like that, you've lost strength. So the more of those little gaps you can take out, the stronger the glue joint's going to be.
And that is for you to pick out when you pick the blades to use for your project. That's why saws are so important because there's a whole lot more going on just sawing some wood. The tooth set is very important. How much offset they have, how big is the curve? The bigger the, the bigger the curve, the more power it takes to push that saw through the wood. That's why we have thin curve blades and regular blades for table saws. Uh, thin curve blades will go through the same amount of wood with 25% less power because they're 25% less thick. The problem they have is that, especially if it's hard wood, that you can get some vibration because the disc is not as thick. So a lot of times on thin curve blades, especially if you're going to cut hard woods, they make uh, stiffeners. Just a steel plate that goes um, on the main part of the disc to stiffen the disc up while the teeth are still the small and they'll go through the wood. But you won't get that wobble, that oscillation. No matter what you do, this is not table saw wood. There is no good solid spark. All you need is a little movement side to side in the table saw, and this is back here. Imagine this hitting you at 100 miles an hour. This is bandsaw wood. So, got to go. That's the safe way to do with this one. And then you can start slicing this every which way. You can slice the bottom, sit up this way, and now you can start just doing layers. Because what are you going to do with this? But if you've got this on the outside of something, it can make it look pretty. So, this gives you woodworking arrows in your quiver with these types of saws. The most people don't use these things near to the capability. We've got folks here that have used one type of bandsaw, I mean, one type of bandsaw blade on their bandsaw and use one type of a saw blade on their table saw. That's just silly. It, it really is. That's like using one kind of car for every type of driving. Well, no. You want a real good, go real fast, you need a special type of car. You want to go through mud, you need another type of car. You want to go through snow drifts 15 feet tall, you need another type of car. Same with woodworking. If you want to go through different types of wood effectively and do a good job, you need a different type of saw. These, the, the, I wish I had a table saw I can use here, but they're using it in the back. You can find you can do joinery fairly easily. Uh, you can uh, really get precise cuts if something needs to be a tolerance of a two thousandths of an inch. With this equipment, you can get that tolerance. And it makes it fun. It makes it easy. And just playing ahead, if I'm going to do dovetails, I'm going to make sure that when I lay out these things, I can take a bandsaw blade, at least a quarter of an inch, and take it down here and flip it and cut this one and then I flip that one. And to get this, all you're doing is just going straight down. And you're stopping about this far. And that's a piece of cake. Any questions?